Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Well, they were perplexed about this. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Rise with us as we worship. Happy Easter. Welcome. He is risen. Oh, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his woes, he arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Faintly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Ah! Uh -huh. 
Easter Sunday, well, whether you are able to be here in person, I, I just say thank you. Thank you all because, as I said uh, Thursday night, it is such a privilege to be here listening to y'all sing, um, especially those, those great old familiar hymns, right? Uh, to, to hear the, the declaration of such a rich theology of death and resurrection of our Lord, of our Savior. And we gather today to celebrate that, and we gather at this time now to pray. And so I would just encourage you to take a moment of quietness, maybe um, even open your bulletin and, and read through those prayer requests, and just ask God as I lead us in a prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is none like you. No one. No one. No other gods, no other man on this earth is like you. No other religion declares that their Savior, their Lord, died for them and rose again. You are the living God. And we come before you now recognizing that you are alive. You are interceding. Jesus, you are interceding for us. By your spirit, you are you're at work in our hearts. And, and F Father God, we, we praise you that you are at work all around us. Our God lives. What, what a great hope that is. And we're going to talk about the... The, the reason that that is a hope, that, that it is relevant to us, God. And, and we are so thankful that we get to come into this place today to freely worship you. As we drove up, as we walked in, we, we see a little bit of snow coming down. It's going to turn to rain. And Lord, what a blessing. We prayed for rain last week and, and, and for moisture, and, and we're getting it. And we're so grateful for that. You are our great provider. We praise you. We, we love you because you have first loved us. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and those who are hurting and ask, Lord, for your healing. Lord, we, we want to we see your power revealed in their lives. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, we're told, lives within us. And we know that that same power is available for us to ask on behalf of others, to intercede and to say, Lord Jesus, heal. We pray for those who, who can't be here today for whatever reason, physical or, or maybe they're work, at work or, or deployed. Lord, we, we pray for our military who are serving our nation, um, guaranteeing this freedom that we have here today. Father God, you have been so good to us, so gracious. And we thank you for the plan that you have established, that if we repent of sin, Put our, believe that Jesus died and rose again, paying the penalty for our sin, and receiving Jesus as our Lord and Master, we will be saved. Thank you for such a great truth. Lord, we pray for our missionaries all across the globe, serving you this morning. I, many of them are unable to worship with their church families, and, and Lord, we pray a special blessing on their worship time today. 
Lord, I pray that this week that they would see um, fruits for their labors wherever they are working. For the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray all of these things. Amen. I hope you're guessing the theme today, right? Resurrection. sin and that we can have new life and Lord we also give you thanks 
that you provide for our every need. Guide us now as we give these gifts. May they be used for your kingdom's purposes, for your glory, we pray. Amen. Children's Church, and if the rest of us can turn in our Bibles to John chapter 20, John 20. (laughs) 
is the most wonderful time of the year. Hey, for, for me, as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, this is it, all right? This is it. This is the most wonderful time of the year. Not only is springtime happening, you know, and, and, and all of that, everything's starting to turn, it's starting to turn green, I noticed yesterday. But um, it, it's, it's that time of year when we gather to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And uh, Pastor Caden, he, he began us this morning by reading the, that part of the story of the resurrection. And I wanted to continue on in um, hearing uh, Thomas. See, see, Thomas didn't really believe, did he, in everything Jesus said he was going to do. Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, and he gets a bad rap for that. But Thomas, um, he, he wanted to have certainty in what was being declared. And so we read in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John these words. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus had come to them. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Note, this is after he had been crucified. We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and, the, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. In fact, he says, in my version, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put out your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, there are a lot of outrageous claims that people make, right? Um, what's the most outrageous thing you've ever said? The Wall Street Journal has followed reports from the Federal Trade Commission of outrageous claims made in consumer product advertising. And I just wanted to read a couple of those to you. Um, the company Luminosity created an app offering a host of brain training games, and they claimed that those games, if a person played them, it would prevent Alzheimer's. It wasn't true, and they were fined $2 million by the FTC. Kellogg Company claimed that frosted mini wheats improved children's attentiveness by 20%. What parent wouldn't go out and buy a whole boatload of those, right? They had to pay $4 million in fines because of false advertising. New Balance, who wears New Balance here? Uh, they claimed that their toning shield could help wearers burn calories, but it was proved that their shoes were no better than anybody else's shoes for burning calories. The person still had to do the work. They were fined $2.3 million. Dan and Yogurt, they claimed that its Activa brand regulated digestion and boosted the immune systems, and it wasn't true, and they were fined $45 million. Yeah, it costs money sometimes when you make a false claim, an outrageous claim. I, I think my, I, I asked my, my kids, uh, have any of your kids sent any outrageous things? Because often I, I will get these texts from my daughters, you know, uh, the kid's name and then uh, a colon and then what they said and it's sometimes it's funny sometimes it's outrageous well w one of my grandsons said I am never going to get married and have children so I don't have to listen to anybody <laughs> now he, he might not get married he might not have children but he's going to have to listen to somebody <laughs> another one of my grandsons um, just recently just, just uh, a few weeks ago said, I I'm going to start working out, and I'm going to put on 40 pounds of muscle this year. He's 10 years old. <laughs> not happening. Now, those, those kind of outrageous claims are not really going to get them in trouble. Um, but one of the most outrageous claims 
that is very troubling to me that I've heard many, many people say, I'm pretty good. I've lived a pretty good life. And I believe that when I meet the Lord, He's going to say, welcome home, because I've been a good person. That is very outrageous. It is very untrue. Because we are not saved by our good works. Nothing we can do is, is pleasing to the Lord. Only the righteousness of Christ that is given to us, put on us, can make us pleasing before the Lord. It's an outrageous claim. But most of you here today have made an even more outrageous claim. We did it this morning. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Think about it. That is an outrageous claim. It can't happen. Physiologically, it is an impossibility. And we call those kinds of things miracles, right? And that's why this day is so special. We celebrate the miracle of resurrection. It is an outrageous claim, but it's true. It's what Easter is all about. The Easter bunny, jelly beans, colored eggs, they're all fun, but they really have nothing to do with Easter, folks. It's all about Jesus. It's all about his resurrection from the dead. He is risen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. My Redeemer lives. We're going to sing that song at the end. Um, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Christ arose. We sing these songs and we make this, this outrageous claim over and over and over because it's true. Jesus Christ is alive. You see, it's easy enough to prove that. And, and we'll, we'll take just a few minutes to do that. It's easy enough to prove that Jesus really did die, he really did rise again. I don't know how, except to say it's the power of God. How God did it, I don't know, but he raised him. The death and resurrection of Jesus, however, is not only a reality, it is relevant. It is relevant. In case you haven't heard that word used much, let me define relevant. It means when something is relevant, it is appropriate to the current time, period, or circumstances of contemporary in interest. In other words, for some it needs to relate to present-day interests or issues. Does it have meaning or importance for us today? Does it have meaning or importance for us today? Do does it make a difference in us today? Is, is the, the question, so what? Jesus rose from the dead. So what? That's what rel relevancy is all about. And I hope to help us see today that, in fact, the resurrection of Jesus has all kinds of relevance, all kinds of importance for us today. In fact, I would declare to you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the most important truth claim to, modern, to our modern human condition. I'll repeat it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the most important truth claim to our modern human condi condition. Nothing else is more important. Nothing else is more appropriate. Nothing else is more relevant. It is all kinds of relevance for people who lived in the past. It is all kinds of relevance for those who will live in the future. It is an et eternally relevant truth. But first, before we look at just a couple of reasons that the resurrection of Jesus is so relevant, let's, let's look at the truth claims. Did he really live? He really died by crucifixion. He really did rise from the dead. Let's look at those. Number one. We have a young Hebrew taken captive in 67 AD, AD by the Roman army. His name was Flavius Josephus. He lived in the first century. He became the historian for the Roman emperor Domitian. And in his first century work, Antiquities of the Jews, he wrote this. At this time, the time of Pilate is when he's writing it about, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. And we need to note that Josephus was not a Christian. 
Josephus was a secular historian, recording the historical events of the past by way of the evidence available then in the first century. There were at least nine other first century historians, writers who, who wrote, all, all of them non-Christian, some of them anti-Christian. They would have tried to prove, disprove the, the reality of Jesus, but all of them attest to Jesus living during the time of Caesar. He lived a virtuous life. He was a wonder worker. He had a brother named James. He was acclaimed to be Messiah. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified on the eve of the Jewish Passover. Darkness and an earthquake occurred when he died. His disciples believed he rose from the dead. His disciples were willing to die for that. Christianity spread rapidly in Rome. Disciples denied Roman, Roman gods and worshiped Jesus instead. Remember, this is in the first century. Remember, they were secular historians. And these documents affirm what the gospel writers have to say. The gospel writers, those Christian writers, those who believed in Jesus, they wrote the same kinds of things. They give a little more detail. But they wrote of Jesus' death and resurrection in that first century. Some of them only 60 years after. And you say, well, that's a long time, Pastor Mark. How, how can you trust anything anybody says 60 years ago? Or something that happened 60 years ago. There's this thing that happened just about 60 years ago. It was called the Detroit Race Riots. And I've read numerous uh, reports, uh, historical writings on, on the race riots and, and what all took place. And I, I can attest to you, they are true. Those reports are true. The reason I know that is because I was there. All right? I, I was like six years old when it went down. But even at six years old, I was watching the news on TV, black and white TV. I'm that old. And, um, and, and I, I saw the violence going on in Detroit. Not only that, we, we got the Detroit Free Press, and I couldn't read, but, but I, I looked at the pictures, and it was awful looking. Not only that, I could sit in my front yard at night and look at the fires. We lived in one of the suburbs of Detroit, and I could see the fires from my front yard. Not only that, but I had family members who told of their encounters with some of the rioters as they had to work in that area where it was going on. So when you hear about the race riots, you read about the race riots of 1967, it's true. It happened. It really did. So to say that we, we can discount those who didn't actually see it, maybe some of these people didn't see it. Well, they had eyewitnesses. They had eyewitnesses. We can trust what they had. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes of of this reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said that more than 500 people had witnessed Jesus die and rise again. There were 500 eyewitnesses who saw it happen. A third thing that, that we can look at is, um, as evidence is uh, the testimony of his brother James. And some may ask, well, that's not a very valid testimony. It's his brother. Sure, he's going to, you know, say good things about him. No, James did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. James didn't believe that he was Messiah. That is until he saw Jesus risen from the dead. And James became one of the greatest leaders in the church, in the early church, because he had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And then there were his disciples. I already mentioned them. They lived... And they died for believing that Jesus, many of, them, many, many of them were martyred because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Who's going to die for a lie, right? Yet these men gave their lives because they knew it was true. I could go on and on with evidences of the resurrection, but I want to spend the rest of our time this morning sharing or talking about what, what I've learned to be the relevancy of Christ's death and resurrection. Yeah, it's an outrageous claim, but it happened. We're not weirdos for coming to church on Sunday and singing these songs. We're not weirdos because we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We're not weirdos because uh, we believe that all of that happened. That is true. It did. So what? The first point of relevancy, I think, 
in the death and resurrection of Jesus is that it gives us confidence that our sins can be forgiven. You can say it out loud. Yeah, amen. Amen. It gives us confidence that our sins can be forgiven. I, I say can be because the potential of forgiveness is only for those who believe, those who repent of their sins and believe that Jesus died and rose again, paying the penalty for their sins, and they receive Christ's offer of forgiveness, surrendering their lives to him as Lord and Savior. Our sins can be forgiven. And those of us who have that faith, those of us who have that hope, it is a great hope because we know that we are not good enough. Romans 3.23, in fact, proves that Romans 3.23 is a special verse to me. It's the verse that at seven years old I heard the preacher pound on it. He actually thumped his Bible. Uh, but, but he was pounding on this fact, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because up until that point, I thought I was just a good kid and no problems. And it was at that point that the Holy Spirit spoke through the Word of God, convicting my heart. I needed forgiveness of sin. I needed the Savior. That same preacher went on in chapter 6, verse 23 of Romans, the wages of sin is death, separation from God. But in Romans 10, 9, Paul continues on, and, and he writes these words. He said, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we can put our confidence in that. Yes, we believe he died and he rose again. Therefore, we can believe that we will be saved when we put our faith in him. Believing that Jesus died and rose again for our sin, that he became our substitute as it relates to God's judgment against our sin. Believing that he not only died but was raised from the dead. Thus, he is our mediator, our intercessor. He is fighting for us. Right? Right? We don't have to do everything on our own. Because not only does he save us, he sustains us. Yeah, the reality is our sin condemns us. But there's also another reality. Christ's work in dying and rising again acquits us. It acquits us. It takes away that guilt. The thing that happens in this forgiveness is that our sin is taken on by Jesus when he died on the cross and his righteousness, his perfect goodness is imputed or put upon us so that, as I said earlier, we get to stand before a holy God in righteousness. Not our own, but in his. We are acquitted. We are guiltless. Friends, there's nothing I can think of that is more relevant Nothing more appropriate to the current time, this current period or circumstances. Nothing more relevant to contemporary interest today than to celebrate having our sins absolved, forgiven. You know, we talk about the darkness of our world today. We see it all around us every day. All of that guilt, all of that shame, all of that sin can be forgiven for those who believe. Those who put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior can be forgiven. Second point of relevance of the resurrection is that the resurrection gives us confidence in the power of God. I just love the opening to that chorus of that song we, we, we sang at the beginning. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. Bam! He laid, out, he laid out the enemy, right? We, we can sing that with all kinds of, of confidence and joy. You may have heard that the phrase love wins. Hey, God wins, okay? God wins. God is victorious. Christ is victorious over sin and death. So we celebrate the power of God in raising Christ from the dead. And in Christ's death, death and resurrection, he defeated sin and death. He is the victor, and the victory will culminate in the last days. As we read in Revelation, when Satan will be defeated and thrown into the lake of fire. It's a very real thing. And I look forward to that. I'm excited about that when the evil one and all evil 
is destroyed. That last song we, we sang, there's a line in there that um, speaks to this truth. Onward to eternal glory, to my Savior and my God, I rejoice in Jesus' victory. It was finished upon that cross. Yeah. It was finished upon that cross. Listen to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1. He says this. He, it's a prayer that he's praying for his, um, his fellow believers. He said, I, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. That was a prayer for the believers in Paul's day. It is a reality for us today. 1 John 4, 4, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Many of you have memorized that one. Because in those times when you're struggling, you, you go to that verse, right? You go to that verse. Hey, great, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about all this mess. You might be beaten down. You might be staring death in the face. You might be looking at financial ruin. You might be losing someone you love. But if you believe in the one who was raised from the dead, if you believe in the power of the one who raised him from the dead, that power dwells within you to defeat whatever enemy comes your way. To stand strong against it. No matter your weakness, His power is made perfect in that weakness. His power, not mine. We don't have the power to, to go through some of the things that people go through. When people say, uh, God will never give you more than you can handle, that's a lie. Because He sometimes does. Sometimes He allows us to go through things that are so difficult that we want to give up. We can't do it on our own. We need the strength. We need the power of Almighty God to rise up within us, to strengthen us. Over and over the Scriptures, over and over in life, we learn God wins. God wins. The third point of relevance of the resurrection, and I'm just touching on a few. Um, I'm not going to take all, all of your time today. But I wanted to speak to a few of these. The third one is the re that resurrection gives us confidence that we too will be raised to eternal life. In Romans 6, 4, Paul writes these words. We died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now, now, we also may live new lives. And in his letters to believers in Ephesus, Paul wrote in chapter 2, verse 6, God raised us up with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I want you to note in that verse, it's all past tense. Has done. He has seated us there. There's an old gospel hymn I remember my dad singing when I was a kid. I've got a new name in glory. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fun song. Um, we, we, we sing that song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through us. There's a lot of truth in that, all right? Those are truths that we sing about. God raised us up past tense, with Christ, and seated us, past tense, with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. It's, it's stating in the past tense because it's a, a sure thing. We don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder if we're good enough, because we're not. Um, we don't have to worry. We can have the confidence in knowing. That, and, and that's sometimes I, I have people tell me, how can you be so confident? That's kind of arrogant. I said, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm sure it sounds arrogant, but, but I'm just basing it on, on what I know is true, the Word of God. And in the Word of God, it tells me that that is true. 
Because of Christ's resurrection from the dead, we have been given new life. We have been seated with Christ. And that new life um, th that I mentioned there, it's new life in the present as well as the future. We are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. We have uh, new banners up today. Hallelujah, he is risen. Next week, they're going to be different again. The old has gone. The new has come. That's the way to read. Because that's what happens when he is risen and we believe. The old has gone and the new has come. Amen? And it, it should reflect in our lives every day. It should. It doesn't. Sometimes it does, but the old is gone, the new has come. We are new creation in Christ Jesus, and he does the work. And his Holy Spirit, if we are in Christ, there's this thing called the fruit of the Spirit. Did you memorize it as a kid in BBS? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Yeah, we, we memorize that, that verse, the fruit of the Spirit, because that's what we're aiming for. That's what... It should look like when the Holy Spirit lives in us by his power, sanctifying us, recreating us into this new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we live this new life in the present. When we baptize believers here in the baptistry, um, as Baptists, we believe in baptism as believers by immersion, and there's such, such beautiful symbolism in it. And I talk about this when I baptize people. When I put them under the water... It looks like I'm drowning them. In fact, one time we were doing baptism, somebody gasped because they'd never seen it before and they thought I was drowning them. It was a rite of passage for Christians that we drown them. No, it's just, but it symbolizes, it symbolizes death to the old self. Being laid down and then coming up out of the water symbolizes new life in Christ. Paul talks about it in the past tense, that we have been seated with Christ because it's that certain. So there's a certainty of new life in the present, but also a new life in heaven. And sometimes people think, ah, you're just so heavenly minded. You're always thinking about heaven. I can't wait. The older I get, the more I say, I can't wait for heaven. I've been tempted a time or two. You, you know when you fill out a loan application, they ask for your address and then how long you've lived there, right? You know, I've lived here 30 years and I feel pretty confident. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna look kindly on my 30 years of living here. It was interesting at men's Bible study yesterday. We went, went around the table and said, where did you grow up? And the number of guys who said, um, I grew up where I was born. Um, they've, they've lived in the same place all their life on the same piece of land, maybe even in the same house as they grew up in. Well, I, I've been tempted a time or two to simply write there um, your address, heaven. How long have you lived there? Forever. Um, because um, my name is there. My, my, my address is there. I don't know what it is. But I'm guaranteed a place. All right? It's there. It's waiting for me. Right? My, my permanent address is not 24406 440th Avenue, as it says on the sign out there on the mailbox. My permanent address is there. And that's the way it is for all who believe. I began by reading about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, or, or Caden began reading, uh, and then we, we finished by talking about this certainty that Thomas needed. And I, I hope that just those few examples of evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection of Christ, I, I hope that you, you have that kind of certainty. As if you put the, your finger in the nail prints in his hand. We can have that much confidence in the historical evidence, in the biblical evidence. At the end of that chapter, I didn't read the very end. So I wanted to save it for now. John finishes this chapter off by saying these words. I write all of this so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. 
That's why as we've been preaching through First Samuel, and I, as I talked about that with Caden, and, and I, I just said, Easter Sunday, we have to talk about resurrection, okay? It's Easter. Um, this is, this is the, the high day of the church, the resurrection of our Lord. John wrote what he wrote so that we could believe, so that we could know the Son, so that we could know new life. Do you believe? I'm so glad you're here today, many of you in person, some of you uh, watching online. I'm so glad you're, you're, you're watching. Um, if you're here to, to make mom or grandma or even make God happy, good luck. Um, that might be the only benefit of being here today, but, but if you're here to be encouraged in your faith, I hope this is encouraging to you. To know for sure Jesus did die and rise again. To, to know that, that it is the ultimate meaning of life. It, is, it has the ultimate uh, appropriation to us in this life. If you're here sensing the Spirit of God prompting you to repent of sin and yield to Him because you don't, you don't know that that Holy Spirit is alive in you. You don't know that if when times get rough, you'll be able to bear up under it. If that's not a reality for you, I invite you this morning to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Just as we take a moment of quietness, did you say, Lord Jesus, I, I realize I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it on my own works. I need you. I need you to save me because only you are able. Please forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you. And begin to walk with him. And if that's something that, that you do in this moment, in this morning, I would love to talk to you about that. My cell number's right on the front of your bulletin. Uh, I'd love to talk to you today. I'd love to talk to you any day about that. If you want to grow in that understanding and in that confidence of knowing that Jesus has saved you from your sin to new life in the present, new life in the future, I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I want to walk with you. Father God, thank you for loving us as you have. As we take a moment of quietness, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move on our hearts, bring that joy and that encouragement to those who believe, and Lord, bring new life to those who have been away from you. Amen. Will you stand with us this morning and sing? I know he rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sins, I believe. I believe My shame is taken away My pain is healing His name I believe I believe I'll raise a banner My Lord has conquered the grave oh, my Redeemer
chains take it away my pain is still in his name I believe I believe I believe it's a better because my Lord has conquered the grave oh, my Redeemer lives my Redeemer